Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sambha Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sambha Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sambha Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami Last week, we spoke about the realms of the cosmos and of our psyches and hearts from the hells all the way up to the heavens. But we didn't make it to the realms of the Brahmas. And in Buddhist cosmology, those are the beings whose minds are equivalent or analogous to the mind state of jhana, or deep unification of mind, and are bright and radiant and vast. And the states, which many of you will know, of loving kindness in Buddhism are named the Brahma Viharas, or the dwellings of the Brahmas, the boundless abodes, and these are the states of loving kindness, metta, benevolence, karuna, compassion, mudita, gladness or sympathetic joy, and upekka or equanimity. And Bhante Analyo compares them to metta being like the sun at noon illuminating and warming everything with light, karuna as the sun at dusk near darkness but poignant for it, just like Karuna is touching on others' suffering. And Mudita, gladness as the sun at dawn with the chorus of birds rising and the sense of uh, gladness to it. And Upeka as the light of the moon, which is not radiant in itself, but rather reflects the light of the other three. Although Upeka is radiant too. And the being, one of the beings I knew who embodied these qualities the most, there can be this idea in some people when you first come to Buddhist practice, we speak so much about letting go and sense restraint and understanding dukkha that we forget that when one does that, when one lets go of craving and feeding off of the world, it's not replaced by a cold numbness or a lack of sensitivity, but the mind that is let go of what it's grasped to is radiant and loving and kind. It moves from the energy of fire feeding off of fuel, agitated and hot, to the energy of light, radiant and blessing and warming. And one of the beings I knew most who embodied this was a monk I lived with named Ajahn Tong, which means Ajahn Gold. He was the last novice that Ajahn Cha ordained. And when Ajahn Chah asked him why he wanted to ordain, he said, I want to fly. And Ajahn Chah said, it's best to fly over the defilements. So it's a good answer. And Ajahn Tong was one of the hidden Kruba Ajans, uh, one of the hidden teachers of great, great spiritual uh, accomplishment who no one really knew about in Thailand. But his metta, his loving kindness, this boundless, bright mind was what I remember him most for. And we'd have the meal, and then I'd, I lived with him for about a year. And we'd have the meal, and then I'd sort of be walking outside in the monastery after, and I'd find him uh, crouched, feeding leftovers from his bowl to a line of ants, because he really loved the ants and wanted to make sure they had enough to eat. And... His metta was palpable, 
we, uh, there was a tortoise that the other monks once kind of found in the woods and rescued, and it escaped from its enclosure. It was a very nimble tortoise one day, and it just went, made a beeline straight for Ajahn Tong's kuti, and it just stood in front of his door, staring at his door for hours until he came out. His metta was so strong, you could just feel it. I saw him uh, bless things at times, and all of his hair would stand on end at once, like, and uh, I asked the other monks what that was, and they said, oh, that's, that's rapture. It's Ajahn Tong's rapture. So this is when you meet, when you realize the potential of the heart through practice, there's no limit. And suddenly the goals we've been held out by our society and our world seem cheap and paltry by comparison. We can live well-adjusted middle-class li class lives for the purpose of awakening, but in and of themselves, compared to what we're capable of in light of our deaths, the goals that society gives us are not worthy. And I think when we really intuit how bright the mind can be, how selfless we can be, what good we can do in the world, how can we not begin to reorient? But the issue with metta is it's so attractive. And we love the idea of having these bright, loving hearts and being radiant, peaceful beings in our work environments and in our marriages and in our families. And yet, here we are, imperfect and often very flawed and with a great deal of anger. And so rather than speak about metta as it's usually spoken about, and to be uh, straightforward, one should cultivate metta every day as much as one can, right when one wakes up, can you bring to mind loving kindness? Because often when you wake up, yourself will crystallize immediately around the most obvious thing, and that's usually anger or desire and craving. So right when you wake up, even before you move, can you bring awareness to the heart and get that glow of loving kindness going? Can you crystallize the self around loving kindness first thing? And that'll pay dividends throughout the day. One should cultivate loving kindness every day. First thing in the morning, can you bow to your shrine and dedicate your practice that day for the sake of all sentient beings? And the last thing at night, but metta is the quality of the mind that is radiant and has let go of dukkha, or at least it's resonant with that mind and heart. And so much of our task is just to learn to restrain the mind from anger. And it's a much more humble and human task, but it's also something that's perhaps almost more important to cultivate because it's where a lot of us spend much of our time. Uh, the Brahma Viharas, the abodes of the Brahmas, these loving kindness states, they're labeled abodes. And I think that implies that when we're not abiding there, we're abiding somewhere else. And often that's in a place of a low level hum of anger and aversion. It can really pervade our lives in a subtle way. And it's relevant to note that in right intention, uh, the Buddha classifies sama sankapa, right intention, the second, sorry, the, the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path as the intention for renunciation, the intention, intention for non-ill will, the intention of non-cruelty. And to note that two of the three factors of right intention are restraining ourselves from ill will. And to understand that if one does that and keeps on restraining the mind from going into anger, that metta is waiting for us there. But sometimes our task really is just to keep from falling into ill will, day in, day out, and that's a constant task. It requires consistent effort because the mind will go there consistently. 
So to also note that Ajahn Brahmali says the two main functions of mindfulness he sees are keeping one's morality, sila, and not dwelling in ill will. So there's a f few things to note here. One is that when we approach metta practice and say we have ill will for someone, it's very tempting at first to try to counteract that by spreading metta to them. But often we just can't. And it's just not in our hearts at that time. And to acknowledge that real good metta practice requires us to be quick on our feet. And noticing always the first noble truth of dukkha and our own dukkha, our own suffering, that it's very tempting to jump straight to the fourth noble truth of developing the path and spreading metta, jumping into a technique. But often what we need to do is come back to our own dukkha and just spread loving kindness to ourselves and acknowledge how much it hurts to be angry. Can we just hold ourselves with loving kindness? Often that's the correct motion of metta when we're angry and dwelling in ill will. The second really important approach is to understand conditionality. And the Buddha spoke about how our mental states and experience come into being conditioned by previous intention, previous karma, and current intention as well. And he really brought to mind these how events and causes lead to others, and that when one knows this conditioned cycle, say in the chain of dependent origination, where ignorance leads to craving, leads to birth, leads to death, and so on, that there's a sense of the orderliness of Dhamma, the thusness of Dhamma, the not otherwiseness of Dhamma, ta 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 awita ta ta ananya ta ta the sense that those words point almost to the settledness which the mind experiences when it sees, oh, this is how it is, and of course it's this way. So much of our reaction and struggle and anger at, and bewilderment at how someone can be the way they are, how our boss can be such a jerk, how our husband can't understand what we're saying, how our loved one won't act the way we think they should act, so much of it is not understanding why. And I think we've all had this experience where when we understand why they're conditioned the way they were, what conditions brought this state into being, we can put it down. Um, so often you learn about someone's childhood, what they experienced or what they're going through at home. And you're, there's that sense in the heart of, oh, of course, of course they're like this. Of course this is how it is. If we really understood someone's history, we could never be angry. And that's that sense of the heart coming to rest in ta-ta-ta, thusness. When we understand conditionality, there's a sense of, oh. And a good analogy is, uh, I think, if we're wandering in the supermarket and someone bumps us from behind and we drop our, our groceries, and we initially have this surge of anger, but we turn around and realize that they're blind, then there's just a sense of, oh, of course, and the anger completely disappears. And if we can understand that all of our unskillful action comes from ignorance, and to, we're just a bunch of blind people in the grocery store bumping into each other and knocking each other's groceries out of the, the hand, and this is an understanding of conditionality, Ajahn Buddha Dasa said that if he could bring one book to a desert island, it would be a little necklace that said, it's like this, which is hilarious <laughs> and true. It's like this. This plays into a really good metta phrase that you can use towards those who you are angry at, which isn't may they be happy, may they get what they want, but actually may they be free of the suffering of greed. May they be free of the suffering of ill will. May they be free of the suffering of delusion. 
you're wishing them true well-being, and that comes in line with skillful action. And to acknowledge that when we encounter someone of truly unskillful nature, the Buddha told us to compare them to a person wandering through the desert, starving and sick, and we should wish, just as we would wish for that person, may they not come to harm, may they be helped. The next thing the Buddha told us is to look to the good. Yoniso Manasikara, which we've spoken about, appropriate attention, where do we turn our gaze? This is one of the factors the Buddha said was a factor of stream entry, of good practice. There are two internal factors leading to stream entry, practicing Dhamma in line with Dhamma, Dhamma nu Dhamma Patipati, and in Yoniso Manasikara, appropriate attention, steering our gaze correctly. And then two external factors, saparisa sangseva, association with good people, and sadamang sawanang, hearing the true dhamma. Hegel said that evil lies in the gaze that sees evil all around it. So turning our attention intentionally to the good aspects of, of those around us. The Buddha said in the Agatha Vinaya Sutta, in the Nguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses, one should look at, to give up resentment, one should look at one impure in bodily action but pure in speech as one, as a monk would come across, as a person in need of cloth, coming across a piece of dirty cloth on the road, would use his feet to tear off the dirty part and tearing off the clean part with his foot, pick just that up and then walk on. Even so, one looks to the good. One should give up resentment towards someone pure in body but impure in speech as a man or a person thirsty, starving for water, would come across a pond covered in algae and gently clearing the algae off the surface of the pond with his hands would stoop and drink from the water and then move on. Even so, one looks to the good. One should give up resentment towards one impure in speech and impure in body, but with occasional moments of clarity and mindfulness, as a person starving for water would come across a hoof print filled with water, and bending their lips to that hoof print of water, careful so as not to disturb the silt, would drink carefully just enough and then move on. Even so, one looks to the good. One should look on one impure in body, impure in speech, without occasional moments of clarity, as one would a person starving, sick, wandering across the desert, thinking, may this person not come to harm, may they be helped. And one should look at someone pure in speech and pure in body, with clarity and mindfulness, as one would a cool oasis, and drinking deeply, lie down on the bank. So these are teachings from 2,500 years ago. And they're so profound that analogies that come from the mind with samadhi, they're so much deeper than we think initially. You see how the monk that, or the person that comes across that first piece of cloth, he doesn't touch it with his hands, he uses his feet. So you don't have to get too involved with the people who are impure in speech. If someone gossips a lot, you don't have to hang out with them every day, but you still look to the good. Similarly, with the person impure in speech and impure in body, you'll notice how the person bends to the hoof print and careful not to stir up the silt. They drink just enough, so you approach such a person gently, careful not to stir up or agitate them, but just take what nourishment is there. And in every one of those cases, the person moves on afterwards, except for the oasis. The oasis, they lie down on the bank. So we take care with who we associate with and surround ourselves with Kali and Amitta, beautiful friends. But this is looking to the good. The other really important uh, 
the other sutta that Buddha gives here is one dispels resentment by spreading loving kindness towards one who one is resentful for, towards, by spreading compassion, by approaching them with equanimity, and he leaves out sympathetic joy because I think he knows that's a tall order for someone we're angry at. The fourth thing, if one can't do the first three, is to not is to consider that they're the inheritors of their own karma, and the fifth is to not bring them to mind, and to know that it's okay. We have this idea in the West that we have to confront every shadow in us right away, but some wounds are deep enough that it's okay just to not bring them to mind for a time. If someone is really still in your heart in a difficult way, it's okay to write their name on a piece of paper, put it in an envelope, and put it in a drawer for three months and just say, for this long, I'm not gonna think about them. And then after three months, bring it out and see if you can approach them with loving kindness. That's okay, time can heal. But anger is stubborn. And the Buddha gave us other tools to work with it. And in my experience, you really have to have a rotating tool belt because usually there will be one nemesis there's a joke that at most monasteries, the guy next to you or the person next to you is responsible for about half the suffering in the world. <laughs> and so to notice this at a retreat, like who's, your, who's the person you've decided to really dislike, you know? And to notice that this is your realm of practice, the most powerful, and, and to know that you're going to have to bring a rotating tool belt. And I think this is why the Buddha gave so many tools. I think more tools to deal with anger than any other defilement. Some, some other tools he gave is in Majjhima Nikaya 20. He says that one should, when one has these thoughts of ill will, one should think of them as a young man or young woman would, if they looked down and saw that they had the corpse of a dog or a snake or a child hung around their neck would feel horrified and disgusted. Even so, one should re reflect the ugliness of harboring such thoughts. It's strong imagery, <laughs> but brilliant. What, what does it look like when the beautiful mind is tainted with that? Um, other recollections, the Buddha said, was one's dealing with acceptance. One said in the, ta the Buddha said in the Tana Sutta, um, one's endurance can be known by when they encounter difficulty and they should think. Um, there is the case where a person encountering difficulty becomes distraught and does not think, this is how it is when living in the world. This is how it is when taking on a personality when there's living in the world, when there's taking on a personality, these eight worldly winds, pain, pleasure, gain, loss, fame, disrepute, uh, plays, praise and blame, spin after the world and the world spins after these winds. Or there's the case where a person when encountering difficulty thinks this is how it is when living in the world. This is how it is when taking on a personality. When there's living in the world, when there's taking on a personality, these eight worldly wings spin after the world and the world spins after these eight worldly winds. That's just so beautiful, like this is how it is. In another sutta, the Buddha says, you should recollect when you encounter difficulty, what else should I expect? Just that simple, sometimes that's enough. Oh, what else should I expect? This is how it is in the world. And all these can lead the mind to a measure of acceptance. Oh, the other thing is to just realize, the Buddha said that to let go of a state deeply, you need to recognize its attraction, its drawback, and its escape. So we know the burn of anger, we know the drawback, we know how dangerous it is, but what's attractive about it? Why do we keep going back to it? The Buddha named anger, anger with its honeyed tip and poisoned root. 
And the sense of self, solidity, rush, and power that comes with anger, that's attractive. Self-righteous anger is so tempting. And let's keep this in mind for 2024, people. And this, I think, deserves a little detour just to, to say that yoni so manasikara, appropriate attention, really implies taking care of your heart with the news cycle and understanding that as practitioners, we have a duty to care for the heart. And honestly, if you step back from the news, one long-form article every week two long-form articles every week, talk to your friends, that's enough to make a difference in the place you need to make a difference. How many times a day does one have to check the iPhone news feed? And what is that really doing to your heart? And just to really take note of that, can we be conscientious objectors in the culture wars? It doesn't mean you can't make change and take action and vote, obviously, but just how much find a balance where you're still protecting the heart. So all these things can help ameliorate anger. And this constant restraint of not buying into anger and to consider that this is a, it, it really is something we have to constantly work with. But that this is how we grow in love and patience. Uh, last week we spoke about Mara and how Mara will strike at the relationships and the places in your life which are most precious. And to really expect that, the relationship with a loved one, the relationship with a child, the most precious places in your life, this is where anger will come. And to acknowledge that this doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means this is the crucible. That relationship is the crucible in which you get to work with this anger. And if you can just hold back, if you can restrain yourself, the heart becomes broader and more patient. And this is how we grow. This is really how we learn to let go of our views. Uh, there's a practitioner I know who said that if he finds himself repeating the same argument to himself three times in his head, he knows he's wrong immediately. <laughs> so that's good to know. To keep in mind also the conditions for admonishment. In the monastic order, we cannot admonish another monk unless we've coming to it at the right time, speaking truthfully, speaking from a mind of loving kindness. So often that will require waiting an hour, a day, but the difference between entering a conversation with that slight splinter of anger and waiting just long enough that there's a sense of spaciousness and centeredness is night and day. The person on the other end of that conversation can completely tell the difference. It's a different conversation. One has to ask permission and be given permission. So can you really approach, this is a good, that firewall is an important wall. Can you use those conditions? Timely, honest, loving kindness, uh, ask permission, and I think free of fault oneself is another one. So we can do our best with that. To also acknowledge that sometimes the relationships that we're closest to is where the anger is the most easily manifest because our self is so much more entangled with those people. So often what really helps with spreading loving kindness to those closest to us is not thinking of them as a child or a parent or a loved one, but as a friend in aging, sickness, death. And that reframing of them as a friend can really give you the small distance you need for that breath of fresh air of metta to pass between you and them. That just gives them enough space to be their own person on their own journey. And they're gonna figure out their own way and they're gonna make their own mistakes. And stepping back just a little gives you that distance. Sometimes metta is like a string and you need a little tautness there to pluck it and get the note. If it's too close, the string is slack and it doesn't work. I find that can really help for metta for yourself too, is instead of trying to spread it directly to yourself, imagine you're in your head and spread it to your heart. And somehow that separation allows metta to actually work.
And self-forgiveness is really important to understand that we are just human. We're trying our best. Um, and forgiveness for ourselves comes in tandem with an understanding of our own and respect for our own conditionality. And the Buddha said guilt and self-recrimination is not wholesome. So these are all ways of working with anger, but I find the most powerful way is often these are ways of accepting things and coming to terms. But often I find we need to lean into the wind. And instead of just begrudgingly accepting a situation, can we be grateful for it? Because only through dukkha, through encountering friction, do we have a chance to practice, really, and find where we're craving and holding on to suffering and let go. There's a great story of a teacher, many of you will know this, who there was one really annoying community member and everyone else was sick of them and one day the teacher was gone and they all chased this person away and he came back and he said, it's Gurdjieff, I believe, in Europe. And um, he said, where's, where's this one guy? And they said, oh, we, we couldn't take it anymore. We, we told him to leave. And he said, bring him back right now. I pay him to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and really, when you understand just that restraint in anger, the chance to hold back, to develop loving kindness, to let go of your own views, to be grateful for that. The Mahayana have this concept that the bodhisattvas split off pieces of their mind and send them down as difficult situations or teachers or met people in our lives to teach us a lesson. And can you really conceive of the people closest to us as these bodhisattvas, these difficult situations, can we really understand them as a gift? Because this is where, if you lean into that, if you really, and, and obviously there are times where you need to set up boundaries, there are times where you need to stand up for yourself, obviously, but can you bow to those most difficult situations and become humble. I've never seen a limit to how deep that motion of the heart can go, how deeply you can bow to humbling yourself. And the majesty of spirit that rests just on the other side of that humbling is unfathomable. And if your prayer every day really is humble me, humble me, you're unbreakable. Because what can happen that isn't exactly what you'd want it to happen? You know, what can happen that can break you then if, if you acknowledge that every difficulty is another stepping stone on your path towards letting go into states of more beauty and spaciousness of heart? So the final thing I'll say is uh, there's these eight phrases in the Tibetan tradition called the eight verses of mind training which I think embody this leaning into the wind better than any other phrases I've known. And these are worth Googling and memorizing. And they go like this. With the highest aspiration for the welfare of all sentient beings who are more precious than a wish-fulfilling jewel, I will constantly practice holding them dear. Whenever I interact with anyone, I will practice holding them as supreme and from the very depths of my heart, no, I will hold myself as lowest of all, and from the very depths of my heart, hold them as supreme. In all actions, I will examine my mind, and as soon as defilements arise, as they are damaging for myself and others, I will firmly confront and avert them. Whenever I encounter someone of unpleasant character, overwhelmed by suffering, I will hold them dear, for they are a precious jewel hard to find. When others out of jealousy mistreat me with slander and abuse, I will offer, I will humbly take upon myself defeat and offer the victory to them. When a teacher in whom I have placed great trust mistreats me, I will hold them as my precious, no, when someone in whom I have placed great trust and helped mistreats me, I will humbly take upon myself, I will hold them as my precious teacher. In short, I will offer, offer to all beings my mother's happiness and take upon myself quietly all their sufferings. May these intentions 
undefiled by the eight worldly concerns, remain untainted. So those have to be held skillfully. One shouldn't, you know, draw boundaries where you need to draw boundaries, etc. But a lot of us have taken on the practice this year of bowing full-length prostrations 28 times in the morning. So if others want to do that, then that's a way of humbling the heart. Um, and may all of us learn to break the heart open to something much larger together. Antamayang tamakataya satu karangatamase satu 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 anumotami So we have time for questions now? Or anything people would like to discuss. So if you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand, or if you're in person, raise your normal hand, and we'll run a mic to you. Mic, Matt? It's a long way. What meta practices do you recommend in the morning and evening, like you mentioned in the talk? Like first thing, that's a, a new idea. Great question. Um, one has to find a meta practice that works. Um, I find sometimes just early in the morning bringing awareness to the heart just that much and kind of almost a nonverbal kindling of the warmth there can do quite a lot. Um, using one's hand and placing it on the heart is actually quite powerful too in a nonverbal way. I find in terms of spreading it to oneself, um, imagining someone you care for gazing at you with goodwill can let you have it towards yourself. People have a lot of difficulty directly spreading metta to themselves and I think if you can kind of embody another's gaze towards yourself, that can really help. Other techniques include just bringing to mind something cute that kind of brings it up. I find thinking of like the cold squirrel out in the tree near my house, just wishing him like, I hope he's warm, you know? That honestly does it to me a lot. Like the squirrels get more meta for me than they know. Um, and uh, I think, um, yeah, another thing is people often sp sp kind of spread metta, but I think it can really help to imagine shrinking the people and bringing them into your heart. Often, if you directly spread out, radiate, it can kind of dilute that metta field, where if you bring it in, it, it really helps. And often I find that metta has a weird proclivity for people to miss themselves and just try to spread it out, whereas so often it's like a much more humble thing of like, ow, I'm, I'm hurting right now, you know? So often I find that's the root to it. And with karuna, instead of these broad visualizations of many beings, often just thinking of one person and the suffering they're going through. And that can be really useful in a day-to-day -day situation, like an airport. Ajahn Jayasaro talks about a practice where walking through airports, he'll spread individual metta to each person with a certain th phrase. Like, if you see someone with big ears, you'd say, May no one ever make fun of them for their big ears. Something like that. Sorry for people with big ears. <laughs> I use that example too much. Did that help? Yeah, it does. So do you recommend doing meta practice in addition to sitting in the morning? Yes, okay. and, and in tandem with it. Um, like I find for those first few, maybe 15 minutes of the day, I just find my mind it, it wants to crystallize so much, it'll just go to anger or craving. So I have to be really mindful for those 15 minutes, like bringing to mind a phrase even, like, may I be kind, and just watching the mind constantly get out of order and then bringing it back. Um, so yeah, really being conscious of that for those fir first 15 minutes. And then when you sit, absolutely, um, any, any sitting where you can bring to mind metta, that's really worthwhile. I mean. 
it's powerful. If I had to recommend one practice to people for 10 minutes a day at least, it would be definitely metta, if they only had 10 minutes a day. Absolutely, yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Go in person first. Can you the online oh, it, it's okay. The um, we had a uh, he uh, he hasn't gotten a chance to speak yet. Uh, Thank you. Um, why is it so much harder to direct meta towards oneself? Do you find that's the case for you as well? It is. It is the case for me. Yes. I'm not sure. Um, modern people tend to hate themselves a little bit. Um, <laughs> That's really a neurosis of the modern mind to, I, I mean, I think there's something there about a deeper part of difficulty, but I find um, a mix of kind of Judeo-Christian foundation of the culture in the U.S. and its focus on original sin, plus consumerism, where advertising really predicates itself on making us feel not good enough so that we'll buy. And that affects us much more deeply than we'd think. And it's one of the most heartbreaking things when you begin to teach retreats is just hearing how brutal people are to themselves over and over. They can be such good people, but so unkind to themselves. So I find skillful means are important, you know, either first having people spread loving kindness to those apart from themselves, and that will affect the self over time, or using these skillful means of imagining themselves as a good friend looking back at themselves or something, just a little bit of distance. But I, I think it really is one of the most, it's a really big problem. And, uh, you know, and the thing is our anger towards ourselves does, it does, it, it will ripple out to others. You know, it's not like we get a free pass on being brutal to ourselves. You know, it's, it's, it's also really a problem, so. Okay, uh, David, online. John, I was nodding and saying yes and jumping up and down, and uh, I try, that doesn't look very uh, Buddha-like, but I think it does. So much, so much goodness here, and I wanted to give a kind of a call-up to Ajahn Kavilo for something he said, Kovilo, last Wednesday, where he said he would add um, both gratitude and forgiveness as the fifth and sixth Brahma Viharas. And that's been my Brahma Vihara study has probably been the most important point. I was told by another teacher who wrote something, read something else, that the Buddha actually had said that if they were practiced to their fullness of heart, that the Brahma Viharas and indeed metta alone could be a complete path to awakening. And I've certainly, certainly come to believe that. And I've related well to what people said about the airport. I do that in the grocery store and just look at people um, without any message, but simply looking at them. And it certainly also gets me out of my own self-pity story to see other people's lives. But what really helped me uh, was uh, prompted a little bit by something someone put up about how do you deal with loving kindness towards oneself and um, I'm fairly lucky so far at this moment to have very few people in my life that I say that I'm really triggered by. Um, that could change, by the way. <laughs> but what is more problematic is the internal moods, thoughts, and feelings. I will become, I'll find that I have ill will towards anxiety or ill will towards a particular manifestation of one of the, the um, defilements as they pop up or impatience with this little per this person inside here. And it's an ongoing process. I'd be very curious as to how you think perhaps we can use kindness in particular, um, goodwill as a, as a method there. The, the one that I sometimes find myself doing is I imagine I have a picture of myself when I was a young and innocent boy. I keep it close at hand. And I can imagine myself picking up this child who was hurt or angry or afraid and putting him on my lap as if I was his grandparent. And sometimes that's been really helpful just to notice that this is a part of the self and not, or a manifestation of something, but not necessarily whatever is true. So any, any further enhancements you have 
I would love to hear that. And again, thank you so much for a really exciting. I'm not sure if Dharma talks are supposed to be exciting, but anyway, I'm sitting here looking like a football fan. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs> thank you. Really good point. How do we work with these things internally? The understanding of conditionality is profound. And to note that many of the sankharas, these are like the patternings that we so dislike in ourselves, to understand that many of them were survival mechanisms from when we were a child. Uh, there's a great writer who said, um, Trauma decontextualized over time is in a people is culture. Trauma decontextualized over time in a person is personality. And I think trauma could be replaced with conditions. But to recognize that often these deepest sankara, uh, like the part of ourselves which needs to be noticed and speak out, uh, so often it's a survival mechanism from when we were a child and to be noticed in our family we had to be extra loud or maybe we'd play the clown because we wanted to keep our father who was drunk easily and became angry very easily from getting triggered and that's how we did that. And just to acknowledge like oh, most of those patterns come from something like that and to when those patterns come up to be willing to invite them in and just sit them down and say, look, thank you for helping me survive. And I, I actually don't need you anymore in the same way. And that's so much different than holding that part of ourselves with aversion, to acknowledge its use, to see why it came into being, and then to send it, to kind of send it on its way. So I, I think that's a really good point. And imagining ourselves as children and, and those different children, I think is really useful. So. Thank you for bringing that up, David. Hi. Um, thank you for teaching today. It's been really lovely. Um, when it comes to the physical posture of meditation, I have a lot of difficulty with that. I've tried to meditate before and found my mind immediately wandering or focusing on how things hurt in my body. Um, and I'm wondering if the posture of meditation that is taught is the only one to curate if there are other options. Do you have a, any kind of... Um just constant pain or is it more just the unfamiliarity of sitting cross-legged or just something that comes up whenever you meditate? Like chronic pain or is it more just you're normally normal but then when it you meditate it kind of comes up? I have some chronic pain and it's a little bit exacerbated by the posture. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to explore ways to mitigate the pain um, that I just have. So... I guess I'm looking for recommendations for that as well because I would really, when I do feel comfortable in the posture, it's really wonderful. Um, yeah. So I guess that's kind of, it's many questions in one. No, it's a great one. <laughs> What's your name again? My name is Taylor. Taylor? Yeah, it's my first time here. Great to meet you. Thank you. Um, first, you can talk to Jessica. I'm sorry, I hope it's okay you're holding her up. Jessica deals with chronic pain. Um, or no, no, you don't. You were at Never mind, you can't talk to Jessica. Okay. I'm, thinking of, I'm thinking of Kristen and Dory, I think, maybe. Yeah, Dory. Um, but uh, the first, it's definitely okay to try different postures. Um, if you're sitting in a chair, just try to keep your spine erect and not resting on the back. You can even meditate lying down. You just have to make the determination not to move at all. And that will keep you mindful. Like, the ability to relax and fade off is often predicated on being able to kind of move a little bit. So if you really don't move, lying down can work. Um, but also to 
you know, first acknowledge there are ways of working with, with pain, and those will be useful no matter what. Um, and those include uh, finding a place in the body which doesn't feel pain, and kind of putting your awareness there, and then almost stroking the area around the pain like you would touch kind of a frightened animal until it kind of softens. A lot of the issue with the pain is this shell we put up around it and solidify around it. So if you can kind of get that to relax and trust you a little more. Um, the other is to put up as you breathe and imagine the breath kind of as this white, bright mist soaking in and out of the body. Uh, hold it up as a canopy around the, the knot of pain and kind of massage it and let it relax that way. The other is to sweep around the pain. So imagine the breath or the energy as white light coming into your head and down and around the knot of pain and kind of eroding and sweeping out the tension little by little. Sometimes that can help. Another, though, if none of those kind of work, is to um, use insight. Like, those are all techniques of, of dealing. Oh, and I know another person who imagines, like, a, a viscous blue cool liquid soaking into the pain, like into the area of pain or running over it. So those are all like skillful means. Another is to bring awareness to another part of the body. Like the, I know someone who had cancer who would just move their fingers in and out to put their awareness in their hand. So these are skillful means. But also you can use insight and gain wisdom through the pain. And there's a saying that like if you wanted to take pictures of all the animals in the jungle or in the savanna, you could either chase them all around and take photos, or you can just wait at the watering hole as they all come to you. And pain is the watering hole. Every habit of mind will come there for you to see and observe. So there's a lot to be gained. So you can kind of watch the pain, see how it changes, say that it's not you, um, watch, label it, like is it just pain or is it aching, is it sharp, is it vibrating? and try to break it down a little bit that way. And that just kind of desolidifies it a little bit too. So, but it, it will be a center point if it's there and something you'll probably have to come back to, but you can gain a lot from it too. Did that it, help at all? It does, yeah, okay. it did. Okay. It will. It will. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And you can talk to Jessica, just not about pain necessarily. <laughs> we, uh, we should wrap up, I'm sorry people. Um, if, if others do have other questions, I know we didn't get to everything, but um, the uh, Wednesday evening live streams, um, every Wednesday, 6 to 6.45, and then 6.45 to 7.30, we have a really great chance for kind of group discussion and questions. That's all on the website. So just want to encourage people to take advantage of that. Um,